Welcome everyone to the meeting of the Nantucket Historical Commission. Um, the meeting is being recorded, so just be careful about what might be captured on the computer. Um, and the recording will be available on the town's YouTube channel at a later date. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and confirm um, that we have a quorum. Um, I know um, David Silver is gonna be, oh, it looks like David, are you here, David iPhone? Yes, I am. Can you oh, hear okay. me? Okay. Yep. Um, great. So we'll start with confirming that David Silver, our secretary, is here. Uh, Clement Durkees? Here. Um, Tom Montgomery? Here. Barbara White? Here. Uh, Mickey Rowland? Here. Um, and Angus um, said that he might be a little bit late, um, that his day was a bit up in the air, but hopefully he will also be able to join and we'll announce him when he arrives. Um, we have our town preservation planner, Holly Bacchus. Good morning. Hi, Holly. Um, we are joined by guest Ken Bogrand. Present. Um, terrific. So, um let's go ahead and see if there's any public comment is there anybody here who wanted to make a public comment not on our agenda um seeing none um the minutes for the november meeting were distributed in the packet um i hope everybody had a chance to review them um are there any comments on the minutes i move we approve them thank you tom a second second Thank you, Clement. Okay, all in favor, um, uh, Barbara? Aye, but I don't think I'm a voting member. Well, why don't we make you a, a commissioner today since we don't have a quorum, or we do have okay. a quorum, but we don't have a full commission and also you were present at the meeting, so um, you could vote. Uh, Aye. Mickey? Mm -hmm. Aye. David? Aye. Clement? Aye. Tom? Aye. And I am also an aye. Um, and uh, the January meetings are forthcoming, so uh, we won't be approving them today because uh, they're still in process. Um, okay, moving on to old business. Uh, we had a um, discussion about the lighting um, in the town. There's no real action item here, but it's something that is an initiative that's important to the town um, and also important to the Historical Commission. So it's something that um, we just want to continue to keep tabs on and advise the town um, as is helpful and appropriate. Um, we had reference in our last meeting to the report by Errol Coffin and um, uh, our energy consultant, who's Lauren, <laughs> Lauren Sinatra very kindly shared this um, and it's in the packet. Um, yeah, Holly, maybe scroll through it. I just want to call out a couple of things. So I, I wrote up um, a summary of this. It's in the packet. And what I took away from that that I think might be instructive as we think about the lighting, um, the, we have two issues with the lighting, the quality of the electrical light, um, which is, uh, affects the atmosphere, but is not really a, you know, it's not a historic object. It's more about the atmosphere of the town, which is of concern to us, but the physical design of the object. So importantly, um, you know, what we know and what this document establishes is that the lights we have are, um, they are from the mid century period. So, we don't really, with the exception of maybe the lights on the Pacific Club, which are older um, and are replacements, in fact, uh, it's more recent history that these lights date from. Um, and they were part of an initiative to solve the lighting problem in a way that was compatible with um, the preservation goals and the tourism goals of the town. Um, and what we learned from Errol Coffin's review is that he proposed two styles. Holly, can you go back up to the photograph from Back Bay? He proposed two styles um, and one of them, the what he called the um, gas light is used everywhere in Boston's Back Bay. Um, it's very, very close to his drawing. Um, and it's used nowhere on Nantucket. Um, and he makes reference in his, uh, in his work to this 
new type of lamp that was being produced in Boston that had a circular form. Um, and I think it's pretty clear that what he's referring to is the boulevard light. And if you go down to the email, Holly, um, I think I had a picture. Okay, so that's the boulevard light. It's, you know, what we have everywhere. And it's, it's elsewhere in, um, in Massachusetts as well. And if you go down to the, I think there's a picture from, okay, wait, let's look at this one. If you go up to the photograph of, okay, so if you can zoom in on that, um, this was a, a lamp on Main Street in the 1950s. And you can see there are these big, ugly telephone poles there right on Main Street Square in this kind of pendant lamp. And Coffin is inspired to try to um, find some kind of solution for lamps on street lighting on Nantucket that would be compatible with the character of the town because a visitor from the National Trust came and said, your lighting is horrific. So I found this picture in the archive of, I thought, well, what, what would the lighting look like that was considered horrific? And, and that's it. And you see lights like this in Boston. So, so he came up with these different designs, but then he references, if you go down a little bit more, Holly, yeah, here's, wait, stop. Um, he says, imitate, uh, okay. Within the last few years, some of the discarded Boston gas street lampposts have been acquired and set about the Jared Coffin house along Old North Wharf. They are in a late, more efficient development of the previously used in Nantucket. So um, around the Jared Coffin house, we actually have more, you know, not replica, but actually antique Boston gas street lamps. And I tried to find a picture of what one might be. So that photograph by the Jerry Coffin House from the 1970s, um, that is probably, I would think what he would be referring to. I mean, we've got some guesses here. Um, and he says, imitation of, of these Boston type gas street lights are being made commercially and electrified. Why they are made with an oil lamp and closing an electric bulb is beyond my understanding. So even he was noting the irony of this, this kind of faux historicism. You know, it's obviously electrical. Why can't it look electrical? Which is always an interesting debate in um, preservation. So I think that is why, um, you know, with the creation of the 1970s, preserved Nantucket tourist de destination, we saw these boulevard lights put in everywhere as opposed to the lights that Coffin had recommended in his report. Um, but that's what we have now. And I just thought it was, yeah, Holly, click on that page 22. Um, these are some dark sky friendly lamps. Um, and I just thought all of this was interesting background to keep in mind as we may at some point, it might take, it will likely take years, approach um, a decision about different LED compatible lamps in the historic town. And to just kind of open our minds a little bit to look at styles beyond the boulevard, now that we can understand, you know, where the boulevard comes from, that there were other alternatives, and there might be, you know, some reason to choose something different in the future. So. Yes, Mickey. Yeah, I know there are street lamps on South Water um, by the Opera House area that are more like the ones to the left. They're not the boulevard lamps. So yeah. South Water does have the old sort of colonial style ones. Yes, yes. And I think we had photographs of those. If they're not in here, they were in the packet before. I know Tom circulated some photos of those. So. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, we should, shouldn't feel, we should recognize that there are a variety of styles. Um, and there were a couple updates with um, Lauren's group asking for some feedback from folks. So Holly, can you um, brief everybody about that? As far as her email here? Yeah, I think there was actually another email. Um, she said, so one update was that the lamp on the horse fountain, there's a, been a dimmer put in there. So 
if people could have a look at it and kind of let Holly know, maybe let, let us all know through Holly, what you think of the new dimmed light, because it was very, very bright, um, but it was a dimmable light and now they have a dimmer on it. And yes, this is the update, yeah. So now we're gonna have a sample um, 2200 Kelvin LED Boulevard style lamp. And it's probably gonna be installed on Main Street on the corner of Federal, which is this picture below. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, and we also had some pictures from um, out by Richmond. There are some lamps put in without the globes. Uh, so those are basically the updates, but I think, you know, we want to continue to be part of this conversation and um, be current. Holly, is there anything you wanted to add from the town's perspective on lighting? Um, no, but I know Lauren will keep me up to date and, and probably you as well. Um, so if I hear anything, I'll definitely uh, send that along through to the commission. Okay. Great. Um, Okay, uh, the next old business item is the joint meeting with the HDC, which we subsequently, after this was posted, learned has been canceled. So, hello. Who? Holly, do you want to let us know? Um, yes, I, I, you know, again, I, I think I was pretty um, explanatory in the email to everybody. Um, I know there'll probably be some dis disappointments, but um, at the end of the day, um, you know, we've obviously had our first meeting, we've had discussions, um, HDC needs some additional time to go over the proposed MOU, um, that way everybody can have a, a, a document that everybody's satisfied on. So just ask for patience and obviously out through myself, we'll keep you updated and when we can schedule um, the actual next CLG meeting with both commissions um, moving forward, so. Thank you, Holly. Ken, did you wanna comment at all? Cause I know this, getting this MOU settled was something that was very important to the town. You'd let us know that in past meeting. I did have a, I did have a, a, a meeting with uh, Ray Paul uh, and Steve Welch uh, and indicated that uh, it, that, uh, the, the, there wasn't an urgency in terms of the timeline because in the fact we've met the requirement of the CLG in terms of having a meeting. Um, but, but I wanted to make sure that, that, that the document that is considered uh, has been prepared and reviewed by the HTC and blessed by the HTC in terms of what it wants so that then we then have the document that the HTC wants to incorporate as well as what the Historic Commission wants to incorporate and have at that meeting the opportunity to work through both of those where, to see where there is not agreement and to see where there's a clear definition of what needs to be addressed and how to address it. So, uh, uh, and I think that uh, it was a very encouraging meeting that, that Ray apologized that with everything that's going on, he and the people have not had time to even, uh, you know, breathe, let alone think about addressing this, but, uh, but it is on their agenda and he is going to, uh, uh, set up a small subcommittee to draft it, and then he's going to get approval of their proposal from the HTC, which then is going to be able to move forward to the CLG. That's encouraging to hear that there's going to be a process and um, that they'll get a group. Because what I was going to ask was if it had, if the decision, if anything had been discussed in the larger group, because um, you know, it's not just Ray and Steve, it's like a whole group of people um, who had agreed to have three follow-up meetings over three months. Well, the, the, the timing is such that Ray, Ray felt that, that in view of the fact that he had to leave before that was agreed to, that was not something that he felt that, that uh, was part of what his understanding was of the, of the timetable. So uh, uh, he's apologetic if that it creates a problem, but, but what I'm comfortable with is, is that, that he is now involved in getting the entire HTC to take a look at it from their point of view as a commission's point of view, as opposed to, and, and he will be setting up a subcommittee within the HTC to be able to come forward with a proposal 
uh, that is then, then voted on and approved by the HTC in terms of the things that they want to see or the issues that they feel should be addressed uh, between the, the uh, two groups as part of the uh, document that ends up being uh, the plan moving forward for the, uh, the CLG. Thank you. Ken, does anybody um, want to comment or have any questions for Holly or Ken about um, what we're working on with HDC? Okay, seeing none. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for liaising with the HDC. And, you know, we're ready to respond um, and really look forward to a good partnership with them. Um, Okay, the next item on our agenda is uh, the three uh, Beaver Street. I apologize. I don't know why I can't spell Beaver. <laughs> I seem to always spell it wrong. Um, it's the, you know, it's my French. Um, but we do have some guests. So we have Erin Doherty uh, from Epsilon. And I see we also have Polly Waldorf, um, the uh, project agent. Um, so I just, before we, I, I'm just, um, I want to figure out exactly what we can, how we can help at this point, because um, as was noted in the minutes, um, there were some, so it's our, um, we, 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 we are being asked for a, a letter of support. We may offer the letter of support for the project. We may decline to offer the letter of support for the project, or we may um, indicate that we don't support the project. These are all options available to this commission. Um, the, uh, the process for uh, receiving state tax credits is um, a competitive one. And the Massachusetts Historical Commission wants to see um, local support for projects, uh, which is why they ask for a letter from the local historical commission. Um, at our last meeting, uh, we had, as is reflected in the minutes, um, various commissioners expressing that they didn't feel the project was a historic rehabilitation um, and asked for uh, a number of things. One was um, the determination of the HDC, which has been provided. Um, and more details in terms of the existing conditions survey, which was circulated this morning. So I certainly didn't have time to look at that. Um, I did look at the determination from the HTC. So what I have a question for um, Aaron is, you know, the next deadline is April 30th. So um, I just wonder why it's, it, can you tell us a little bit about why you wanted this to be on this meeting's agenda when the additional information wasn't available until late yesterday afternoon? Sure, so just to give an update on the status of the project, Hillary, as you mentioned, since November, the project has completed its HDC review, which was a condition of coming back to you to further discuss the letter of support. So since that time, um, the project has also submitted its federal historic tax credit applications. Those were submitted back in the fall. Um, those are under review with the National Park Service currently. The part one application was actually approved um, this week. Um, but the project did also submit uh, state tax credit applications in the January application cycle. So there are three application cycles a year for the state tax credit program. January, April, and August. So we do currently have an application pending with the Massachusetts Historical Commission for state credits. Um, so, um, you know, I realize you, you may not have had much of an opportunity to review these additional materials thus far. We're happy to, to walk you through them. Um, but the reason for, for returning today is that we do have that application under review with MHC. Um, and we would uh, hope to be able to submit a letter of support um, to be considered with this application cycle. I see. So you let them know that the letter was under review. Yes. Is that correct? Sure. Okay. So this is for the January cycle. And yes. that's yes. the urgency. I understand. Yep. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. Um, sure. So First of all, I just want to ask the commissioners, did you all have a chance to review the um, 
the the project, uh, the the rehabilitation portion of the project. And did anybody have a chance to review the information Holly circulated this morning? It looks like Tom is saying he reviewed both. I, I, I did didn't. not. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, my phone is. Yeah, okay. I I was out of the office at four o'clock, so when I received it, I, yeah, I wasn't here, so sorry. Um, but I also did want to, you know, mention the HDC did approve. However, it is um, I want to make it so it's clear that it's a an approval through staff. So these are the items that need to be. I don't know if I can highlight this. That need to be addressed um, before staff is going to provide. Um, the actual COA, um, that is essentially something that I would be um, doing. So they have conditional approval. Um, it's not finalized yet. So I would assume, Polly, you're working on that to, to get that to us. Um, but yes, they, they, they voted on it. Glad to see that. Um, once we get that information, we can actually give the formal COA approval for that. Um, so I just want to mention that for you all not familiar with that process. So do the commissioners feel like they're able to um, have a discussion about the project? And I, I, I just wanna say this is, it's just a little irregular because we really want all of the information together so we can look at it a week in advance. Um, and it's coming to us in pieces with people partially reviewing it. So, um, I think I would like to hear from the commissioners whether or not they feel we can actually discuss this at our meeting. Mickey? You know, I, this, is a, this is a complicated one. It's so, so far to me, through what's going on at the HDC, it hasn't, it hasn't really quite felt like um, a lot of effort has been put into restoring or rehabilitation. It feels more like a kind of a, you know, just a kind of a renovation project. And I, it, so I, and I haven't reviewed Holly's inf recent information. So I think I need to see more about what's going on to understand the rehabil rehabilitation aspect of it, rather than just what, what I've seen at the HDC, which involves raising the building changing some windows and doors, adding a dormer, um, you know, much of which to me, I wasn't really keen on as it, as it affects, you know, the appearance and character of a, a really old building it seems to be kind of counterproductive to raise it and make these changes. So I'd like to spend more time reviewing more information before I make any real decisions. Thank you, Mickey. Um, Barbara, did you have any comment about whether or not you feel we can? Well, I, I feel like I came into this midway through this project. So I, I, I felt even the last time we discussed it that I was not completely feeling comfortable about it because I felt like I missed the beginning and I certainly didn't have time to read it this morning. So um, I, I wouldn't feel, and normally I'm a non-voting member, so it doesn't really matter, but um, I, I wouldn't feel particularly comfortable today. Okay. Um, Clement? Hello. Yeah, as I recall last time, we there were certain things that we were asking um, to get answers to, and I don't feel like we've gotten the answers to those questions. There was something about why up three feet, we were gonna get a flood uh, estimation, and um, there was something about the chimney and, there was something else about um, window wells and door movement. Um, and I don't feel like those questions have been answered. Yeah, the flood elevation was provided. Um, I mean, we didn't get anything a week ahead of time, but we did get the HTC material. When, when did that go around, Holly? Um, on Wednesday? I, I think so, I think I... Um, you know, as soon as, and Polly knows, as soon as I received it, I provided feedback as, as soon as I possibly could, um, understanding the importance of this whole process with both the HDC's review and you all's review for the historic tax credit application. So uh, I guess that's helpful that I'm, you know, liaison with both commissions. 
Um, but I did, I, I, I did have some critical comments on the, um, the, the structural engineers um, take, if you will, on a resilient Nantucket design guidelines. Hey, you know, I'd love to hear those, Holly. Why don't you go ahead and share that? Um, let me just look it up real quick. My apologies, because I can't remember. <laughs> um, So the biggest thing was um, the letter itself didn't, which is something that is very typical in an engineer's letter, it didn't address the, the BFE, the base flood elevation. I know, Aaron, you did, so thank you for actually providing that. But it, that's kind of part of the conditions that the HDC wanted. The, the plans and the um, engineer, uh, the drawings themselves should have the, both the BFE and the DFE. Um, so that was something that I, I did bring up. Um, it is noted that this, this elevation project is to be proactive. I think we all understand it um, from a hazard mitigation perspective. Um, this falls within the 2% chance of, of flooding. We do know with our storm tide pathways, um, with our resiliency efforts that are going on that this, this area does get inundated. It's not located within the AE8, but it's fairly close. So I did want to make that a point. Um, but again, that would be the closest line um, within um, the area. Um, and he did indicate in the letter um, that the, the new um, would be at least one foot above the anticipated flood elevation. Um, you know, I want to make it a point that the HDC did approve that. They also approved it with a, which is very typical of um, some of these elevation projects of having that course um, shingle course down another layer um, to kind of um, kind of you know help mitigate, if you will, that elevation. Also, Polly did provide, um, which I apologize if you guys didn't see that, but a proposed um, what the brick will will look like on the the foundation. You know, there was discussion, and it's actually in the HDC's motion about retaining as much as that existing rubble foundation as much as possible which is obviously something that they've done before in the past, something we encourage, something's encouraged within our design guidelines, if you're not familiar with that. Um, so that would be great to see. Um, so, you know, it's not going to look like a, a poured uh, contemporary um, concrete foundation. It's going to look like any of the other elevated typical Nantuckets um, along obviously Beaver and, and the adjoining streets. There were some photographs provided too, um, I know, um, for the record, Linda Williams uh, assisted both Polly um, and the owner on this application, provided some photographs from the now Independence Way, which used to be Coon Street, to show you can actually see the sag in, in, in the, um, the ridge. Um, so it does need assistance in that. Um, but the, the dormer has changed. Again, I would really like to just show these, um, these plans for you. Um, because I think that would be that would be beneficial, I think, to help along their process. In the email that I forwarded to you all this morning, um, I think Aaron did provide the photographs showing what you all wanted um, as far as the condition of the um, the chimney. But what's important to see is also um, the owner, uh, through the assistance of um, Linda. Um, had, I don't know if you're familiar with 3D laser scanning, which is something that PIN Preservation Institute in Antarctica has done over the past, but there's also a gentleman who um, is doing this on his own. Um, Anton, I'm so excited to see this work. So this was, this is a, a, a perfect building to have these, these um, 3D laser scans. It's just awesome. So that was helpful to include within the application itself. So the merits of the application from a Meeting the HDC's design guidelines from both building with Nantucket in mind and uh, the resilient Nantucket design guidelines, which again follow the, um, they weren't created in a vacuum and, and follow the Secretary of Interior standards for all of those requirements, um, have been addressed. I think the, the real crux of it all is have the conditions met that the HDC asked for, for both on the plans and the engineer's letter. And that would, I think, be helpful for you all as the commission to provide your support. Because again, at the end of the day, you are not looking at it 
from a certificate of appropriateness perspective. That's already been done through the HDC. But again, we do have those pending conditions that need to be addressed. So that's my take on the whole thing for you all. Yes, Erin, go ahead. Yeah, just wanted to jump in and really appreciate that summary, Holly. Um, and just to kind of back up, I know there are questions on documentation. So, um, you know, prior to the November hearing, you know, we submitted the full part one and two applications, tax credit applications for your review. That's everything that MHC is seeing, everything that the Park Service is seeing. And then of course you had these additional requests for documentation, which we've compiled. And I'm happy to take you through the photographs specifically, even if you're not going to make a decision today about the letter, since we're here, happy to walk you through um, both the additional photo documentation and then also the updated plans. Polly can walk you through and identify those areas that have been revised since the plans that you saw in November. There've been, uh, as Holly mentioned, revisions to the exterior, scope of work, also some minor revisions to the interior. Um, you had also uh, expressed concern about the uh, removal of the uh, center chimney stack. Um, and since uh, November, there has been exploratory demolition completed to identify what remains of that chimney stack. So we can uh, take a look at those photos um, if you would indulge us on that. Um, and also uh, we went through and provided some additional photo do documentation of the framing of the building, which had been a question at the last hearing. Um, you know, a lot of the framing is, um, some of it is exposed, some of it is encased. They're really, uh, uh, most of that will be retained and supplemented in this project. As Holly mentioned, the, the house does have structural issues that need to be mitigated, but the approach, um, is to retain as, as much as possible and supplement where needed to ensure that this building is you know, structurally stable. And then Polly can speak to that as well. Um, but just to these, the photos that Holly has pulled up, um, thank you. So the crawl space has been difficult to document because the building sits at grade um, and the underside of the structure is about three quarters of it is filled to the underside of the framing. Um, but there is uh, existing brick and rubble stone, and um, uh, there, you know, that material will be salvaged and, and reused to the greatest extent possible, um, as the HDC also wanted to see. So this is not going to be an exposed concrete wall foundation. Um, it will be faced. Um, in terms of the framing, you can see there's kind of been a variety of treatments to the exposed framing of the building over time. There's been some encased, some trim added. Um, a, a lot of the interior trim actually dates to probably the mid to late 20th century. So we've got layers and layers of, of additions um, that you can see some of that framing um, in these pictures. At the photo on the lower right, um, the beam that runs across the ceiling, actually that was a former exterior wall of the building. Um, so, sorry, one down, number 10. Um, uh, that beam that runs across the ceiling, that was the exterior wall. So at some point that wall was opened up and the side addition kind of incorporated into that first floor bedroom. Um, if you go down some additional framing, uh, you, you can see on the left, there's been, you know, that's some of that later uh, framing that um, that uh, has been added at the, at the first floor closet. Um, in the dining room, uh, a lot of the beams are encased with more modern materials, um, but they do remain um, expressed. And that's kind of typical throughout the building. Um, there are some exposed members at the second floor. Um, there are later partition walls that don't really align with the framing of the building. So you can see that beam running through the uh, southwest bedroom in photo 16. Um, that's going to be you know, kept, kept in place, reinforced. Um, again, here, some of that encased, uh, encased framing, um, probably from the uh, mid to late 20th century. Um, in one of the second floor bedrooms, there's some fully exposed uh, framing you can see in that photo. And then also some additional encased uh, material. 
This is the attic, everything is uh, fully exposed. In photo 21, you can see um, where the former chimney stack um, uh, rose through the roof. There was also in the kind of late 20th century, there was a smaller chimney that was put in that has been removed as well. Um, and if we go keep going down, some of the non-historic partition walls that had been um, installed around the chimney stack were removed to assess what is left of the historic uh, chimney stack. Um, as you can see, it is, it's no longer there. Um, you can see some of that later framing in photo 28. So this is up at the second floor. Um, when those walls were removed, what was revealed was uh, loose bricks, essentially. Um, if you go down at the first floor, um, some of that paneling was pulled off of the uh, chimney wall. Um, and again, you can see it's in very poor condition. So um, I understand you didn't have a chance to look at this ahead of time, but I just wanted to walk you through that um, in terms of speaking to some of the questions that came up in November. Um, and if you'd like, Polly can take us through those uh, revisions to the plans since uh, November um, that have occurred. Sure, I'm happy to. Thanks, Erin. Um, and thanks can for I just, us sorry, Erin, can I ask some questions before we move away from the pictures of the masonry? So mm -hmm. I know you said that um, the second floor um, hearths were already demolished and that on it, correct me if I'm wrong I that's what I recall was that you knew that um and now you provided photos of that am I right we about that not, we did not know that so oh, no everything was been done it was I see. all yeah it had all um this shows up in the the um the last set of photographs um they were all like modern walls all wrapped around. So you couldn't see any of what was going okay. on inside of that stack. Um, so that was documentation that's been done now. Okay, so you removed the walls and you just found that rubble just spilled out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, um, the contractor found, um, if you go down to the first floor, you see how they um, you see how they had put a stove in there, a propane stove. Um, he he kind of oh shoot, I'm sorry. He felt that the um, sorry sorry about my phone there. Yeah, he felt that the you know the propane really did a, did a number on the um, mortar in there between the bricks and you know really disintegrated it over the years i mean obviously it was in bad shape when they put they tried to put the stove in there to begin with since they had to get it all um concreted up in there and everything to put the stove in there but that just kind of was the nail in the coffin to the mortar throughout the chimney and they did it i, th I think they might have done it in the kitchen as well and the um the the basement there's a crawl space but was there also a cellar no there wasn't okay i thought there was a reference to a crawl space and a cellar with a brick paved floor no no, no it's all dirt floor and, okay yeah, so it's, it's just crawl space, space below a hundred percent of it with dirt mm -hmm. right and, and it's it's filled to the underside of the structure so if you um there's actually notes on, if you scroll up a couple to the uh, key plans, Holly, if you're able to do that for the basement, um, Polly yeah, has right kind there. of marked out where it's filled. So you can see the majority is filled to that underside of the structure. And mm -hmm. then just that uh, small section along the north has that crawl space. Yeah, I think they dug it out when they did the bathroom years ago because the bathroom and the kitchen you know when they did the indoor plumbing for the bathroom and the kitchen because those are right in that area so that's probably when they dug it out correct me if i'm wrong my understanding is even the sill right now is pretty much rotted right because it's been sitting on the ground for so long correct yes it is yeah they basically have it sitting on the ground and then they stuccoed over it and i did I, I i don't know if there's a picture in here but there was a section where the stucco had kind of broken off and you can see the shape of the sill there um 
it is definitely riding there. Um, do the commissioners have any questions about the existing conditions uh, photographs of the masonry and the framing? No. Okay. Um, all right, so Polly, let's hear about um, what the uh, plan for development is. Sure, after we went through the HDC um, and you know, in response to your comments too, um, on the first floor we are going to, or you know, on the lower level, we're gonna completely um, waterproof the area down there um, and get, um, a couple of bedrooms down there, mainly the utilities, <clears throat> excuse me, down there so that we don't disturb the historic areas of the house, the first floor and the second floor with any chases um, or any soffits as such for the mechanicals. Um, so we'll have all of that in the basement below the, below the ground and we'll restore where um, you will see they've put some bump outs and things throughout where they had the um, hot water going up to all of the radiators and throughout. So, you know, we'll be pulling all that back and, um, you know, refreshing that. So basically we'll have mechanicals in the basement, mechanicals in the eaves of the attic. Um, so then the first and second floor, you know, will be, ac will be um, sorry, serviced from those two floors. So that will be preserved. And on the, if we go up to the first floor, um, you guys had concerns about where we were putting that half bath in the hallway. Um, you suggested we keep the hallway, you know, kind of open it up and keep it with the entrance that it had. Um, so we put, we moved the half bath um, over off of the hallway. Um, and then between the uh, living room and the kitchen area, we will, you know, keep the semblance of the wall. We'll just put a large opening in it. Um, so you still have the historic, you know, know where the historic wall was. Where we have beams that we could expose, we certainly will. And our plan, I've, you know, I've spoken to the structural engineer and he did in his letter um, indicate, it might have been a little, I know it was a little confusing to Holly, but he did indicate that he will make every conceivable effort to use well, definitely to maintain what's there um, in terms of the structural members and to use historically appropriate structural members um, as, you know, as, as possible. Um, and we definitely, you know, appreciate that comment um, and we'll, we'll do our utmost to keep the structural and framing materials and all materials um, period appropriate. Um, and what else has changed since we last met? The stairs are going straight down to the sides instead of curving. Um, the back door changed. Well, probably the elevations now would be the best way to go. There we go. Um, yes, yeah, so the front door, we beefed up the trim around it. Um, I actually, you know, got some pictures around Nantucket and we kind of, we based this door design on the Lightship Museum door there. Um, kind of got beefed it up a little bit, but still trying to keep it, you know, more simple to go with the period of the house. We added the historic chimney back. We um, are, we're going to make every effort to use salvaged brick. Well, we will use salvaged brick definitely on the front of the house here. You know, what you see from the street. Uh, we will use salvaged brick also in the window wells as well will be lined with salvage brick or brick faced. Um, but at least the, you know, the top portion that, that will be seen will be um, the salvaged brick. And yes, the west elevation, we, you know, minimized the dormer. We brought that back off the ridge. Um, and then our, our stairs are just going straight down to the side. That's what's changed since we just met. We're retaining and keeping the windows there and repairing them as necessary and also same as siding um, whenever we need to. And um, I know this elevation was a, was a bit of contentious. We you know, heard you, we went back and we made sure all of our windows were as uniform in size as possible, gave it some more symmetry um, and you know, went as minimal as we could with the egress windows. Um, 
So I think that uh, you know definitely achieved a really nice look there. And then on the rear elevation, the French door, we changed that to a um, 12 light French doors with the kick plate and removed the side lights from that French door. And then the dormer, um, those windows, we were trying to make those the egress windows that ended up going into the, um, in order to make it egress, it had to be crank out. So instead we made these three over three and the egress window is actually, um, you know, for fire egress will be on the gable at the, I think it was the west elevation. So those are the changes that we've made um, in response to HTC and working with HTC. And I think we got a nice product here. I think it'll look really pretty. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, sure. Comments from the commissioners? Okay. Mickey, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm still not clear, not, it's not clear to me um, the elevation height that is being raised. Um, in terms of the, the base flood elevation, where, where is the proposed floor level in relation to the base flood elevation? The base flood elevation is 8.8 8 .8 at this property. And we are the design flood elevation, so the floor floor level of the first floor will be at um, 11 foot eight. 11 eight. So you're yes. going well above what's required in terms of, um, you know, normally it's a foot above the base flood elevation. Um, so you're, you're um, and this, is, this has been sort of our issue at HSAP the whole time is that you're raising the building well above what's required in terms of preserving the structure and also codes, even though you're not in the AE zone, you, you, you can, if you're, you're close enough that maybe you wanna re, re, you know, um, go along with those guidelines. So you're, you're a few feet above where you really need to be. And that really changes the character of the building. So that was a big concern. It's more of, you're not preserving the building, you're creating more usable space, which is, to me, a little beyond um, rehabilitation, I guess. Um, but so, so that was a concern. The other thing that, that I didn't in particular like, and is you know the HTC seemed to actually like this, was lowering the shingle line, which to me changes the the relationship of the windows and the doors, the natural relationship. If you're creating a false shingle line um, below where it normally is, but you know, I understand that this has been approved by the HGC, but actually, Holly, what has been approved in terms of the height? Did they, they were waiting for elevation information. So did they approve it as it's proposed or are they approving it at a different level? No, oh, as was proposed, this was their condition, so those items need to be addressed before they get their official COA. Okay. I think the question for us is, do we feel it meets the criteria of a historic rehabilitation? You know, it's the HDC has determined that it's appropriate for rehabilitation, you know, pending meeting final staff review on some outstanding issues. Um, but the tax credits are, you know, taxpayer dollars that are that are used to encourage historic rehabilitations, which have, um, you know, which is, a, it's something that's defined. Um, and while I'm recognizing that elements inside in terms of the framing that's being preserved, um, the responsiveness to create more space around the staircase, um, preserving the staircase are all positives. Um, Lifting the structure is not necessary to get it out of the flood zone. It's necessary to create more space in the basement for habitation. And that's absolutely your prerogative. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, and I wanna be clear about that. But I think the question is, do, um, does lifting a house 
that doesn't need to be lifted um, for protection I qualify as a historic rehabilitation. I, 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 and I'd love to hear other people's opinions. I mean, that's what I would put out there as the fundamental question. Um, additionally, the conjectural front door, does that meet the definition of a historic rehabilitation? Because you don't need to have a front door there. It's not you know, required by code. Um, it's conjectural, uh, yes. I'm seeing hands from Aaron and Polly. Sure. And Holly. So just, okay. <laughs> um, just, I guess to address your last point first, as yeah. far as the front door. So we do know that this property historically had a front door in this location. We have found historic photographs that show yeah. that it had a front door in this location. So um, that is an effort to restore an original feature that has been lost as part of this project. So it's it's not conjectural. Um, I, I would I would I wouldn't characterize it that way. Um, you know, it's it's restoring a feature that has been lost based on the available documentary evidence. We don't have a straight on elevation photograph of the door, which is why uh, we've had to look at other uh, examples to refine that design and ensure that it's historically appropriate. But, but that is the original front entry door location for this property. Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong, you included that within your Form B? Yes, it was included uh, in the Form B and the Part 1 application. I yeah, I think that. it would be helpful, Holly, if you yep. have a picture of the photograph. And I, I do remember that, Aaron. So thank you for calling that out. I do remember that you, um, that there was a front door here, but I think the um, the conversation in terms of rehabilitation and preservation is around whether or not, and you know, this is something we covered in our conversation the last time around, whether or not you really have enough information to justify bringing something back that's been lost to time, especially lost so long ago to time. Um, so that there was a front door, but you know, we don't really know what it looked like. So what's conjectural is not whether or not there was a door, but you know, this is the door inspired by a completely different building in a different place from a different time period using stock parts. Um, it's not, you know, it's not an antique door. Um, so that's kind of what I meant when I said it's, there are elements of it that are conjectural. With all due respect, I do have to interject the fact that the HDC has historically, pun intended, mm -hmm. allowed features being added back onto a historic structure that was once lost. Mickey can vouch for this. I know Angus, if he was here, he could vouch for this. This is something, as long as there's proof that that feature was there, whether it's a door, whether it's a window, whether it's a, uh, um, uh, you know, um, we see a lot of it for um, siding, for instance. You know, they want to take away the, the cedar shingles and, and um, put clabber back on. Those are, have been allowed to be put back on. So um, that's why the HDC allowed for this door to go back to its place. I'm trying to look up the form B. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry. And, and I am not saying that the door is inappropriate. And I understand that the HDC, you know, has a different standard in terms of their mission is to let buildings evolve in ways that are consistent so that new construction can be consistent and compatible. Um, but the idea of a historic rehabilitation is to actually preserve what's there. Um, it's different objectives, but. I would disagree with that, but that's my opinion. Well, it, I think it might be helpful to actually bring up um, the, Secretary of the Interior Standards. I mean, I know we went through them um, last time because we, we certainly don't want to be inventing the standards for rehabilitation. I mean, we're trying to determine whether or not, in our opinion, if we agree that, and if we support a project as a rehabilitation um, consistent with the standards that are defined. Yeah, if I can just also speak to your comments on you know the addition of basement space and whether how that fits with the rehabilitation program, um, you know it's it's not unusual that 
additional space within a structure might be created or captured in a rehabilitation project as living space. More broadly, you know, we have seen there, there are many historic tax credit projects that involve conversion of basement space to living space, conversion of attic space to living space, additions to buildings. Um, you know, we sometimes see rehab projects where uh, really substantial additions will be constructed, connected to, or adjacent to historic properties. Um, and that is viewed as acceptable under the rehabilitation program. I think the rehabilitation program is, is a little bit different from other preservation uh, treatments. There's a lot more flexibility um, in terms of adapting these structures for a new use while preserving the character defining features of the structure. That is really the mission of the uh, rehab program, um, which is unique and, and different from other treatments. Yes, thank you, uh, Holly, for pulling those up. So we, we were able to locate two historic photographs of, of the building through uh, local repositories. So this is from 1940. Um, I think that the earlier photo, although, um, it, the building is more of a distance actually gives a more clear view. There's less uh, vegetation on the front of the building. Um, so this gave us our first cues for how to design that um, replacement uh, front entry surround. Um, it's a simple structure, um, as has been mentioned. Um, so the effort was to toward uh, keeping, you know, that simple surround looking at these historic photographs and also other local examples that have been well-documented on the island. Um, so if, if there are specific aspects of the design that, that um, you, know, you would uh, wanna see tweaked, we, we can certainly uh, look at that, but we felt like with the input of the HDC and some more research on our end that um, this was kind of in, in a good place um, to move forward with, but we would uh, welcome your feedback. Um, Mickey, go ahead. Yeah, I think, you know, I think the, 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 the thing that concerns me is that raising the building, it's, you know, adding space to the basement is fine. That's, you know, that, that's understandable. But when it's raised to add the space, I think it alters one of the character defining features of the house, which is its connection to the ground is built low to grade. And when, when it's raised up to add the space, I think it changes, you know, a real important connection there. And dropping the shingle line has a similar feel to me. So to me, that is a big concern. If you could add the space without raising the building, that'd be great. Um, much better. Yes, Holly. Hi, thank you. Um, yes, I mean, as the engineer noted, it needs a new foundation no matter what. The foundation is a mess and this will probably be the last time in a couple of centuries before this building does get a new foundation. The, um, the flood level was determined or you know the, the flood maps were determined back in 2014. Since that time, um, I, you know, I did a little research on the last from 1980 until now the record flood levels on the island. And since 2014, when this map was drawn, there eight of the last 10 were in that in the time period since 2014 to now. So um, I, I just feel that if we don't raise it sufficiently, then we're gonna be back at the same place and possibly lose the structure again. Plus when you look at around the neighborhood, directly across the street, is a property that has been raised. Um, I had given that as what we were looking at for the brick on this one. That one has been raised um, over, over three feet. It looks like, you know, about three to three six there. So there is precedent in the neighborhood for raising structures. And I don't know, my feeling is that we are, you know, trying to say, yeah, there we go, that, that one. So. We're, we're still saving a significant part of this building historically that I think it should be granted or at least acknowledge that that's, that's what we're attempting to do here. So the tax credits are not, not a right, the state tax credits, the federal tax credits 
are right. And, um, and the determination is, you know, the, the reason for the tax credit is to, um, to keep these structures, keep the defining features of the structure in place and that that generates additional cost and effort from you. And it, um, you know, it gives you a, it helps encourage the preservation of these defining um, features. I agree when you're talking about a really, really simple ancient structure, which this is, the relation to the ground, um, the way uh, that the massing, the form and the relationship to the street is a defining feature. Um, and I think when you raise it three feet and you put a stair on the front, um, like that uh, and the you know the shingles and the proportion it's really going to look very different um i don't disagree with the hdc's decision but as far as um you know our goals of keeping these ancient structures recognizable as ancient structures so that people can experience what it was actually like um i think this looks like a very different building um, can, I just Tom, can I hear from some other commissioners? Tom, did you want to say something? Yeah, uh, this building is, as we all know, located on the eastern end of Beaver Street. And I think other than the hurricane of 38 and the no-name storm, the two highest levels, water levels that have come up, I know we're dealing with climate change and all that other stuff. This house is, even if you look at those old photographs, significantly uh, positioned far enough away from the waterfront that it would have to be a horrific high tide that would even get to this house. And even then, it would have to be pushed by wind like we had in the no-name storm, 100 miles an hour, in order to fill that area as, as it did, you know, the other day when we had that, that storm. But to, to raise it up, uh, I, I'm more with Mickey and with uh, Hall, uh, with uh, Hillary, in seeing what you can do to, if you want to have a, you know, more of a basement there for a living or, or whatever, uh, to dig down a little bit more. I don't think it's going to affect it. The water table is going to affect it that far back. And my other comment would be about the front door. Um, I don't know if anybody's done any research on back when this house was built, but um, doors, you know, were either six panel or four panel on the front of the house. And I don't know, to tell you the truth, I used to build doors, but I don't remember you know, I had to look that up myself uh, whenever I did something like that. And I see it looks like a six panel door there, but um, if there's any way of doing research about how that front door looked, I'm not talking about the casing, I'm talking about the door itself. You know, that's what, that's what I would go for, but that's not our purview. that's the, that's my only comment. So I think, um, Clement, did you have anything you wanted to say? No, sorry. I, since I had to be gone the last 30 minutes, I have not oh, okay, uh, yeah. been following this. Sorry. So I have a couple observations. One, I would really have appreciated time. You know, we have a more of a luxury of time than the HTC does. I know they're in the habit of just reviewing things, you know, as they come in. But um, we asked for the information a week ahead of time, and we literally got it this morning. So I have not had time and nobody has had time to look at it and compare it to what we got before and really think about it. Um, and we all, I'm also noticing that we don't, you know, we're, we're missing Angus who is our other architect um, on this group. And I um, understand that you'd like to have your letter now because you've already put the application in for January 30th. But I, I just don't think, I think we have a lot of questions about whether or not we can approve um, a raised structure like this as something we consider meeting the standard for rehabilitation in the absence of it really being um, 
necessary for flooding purposes, and this is borderline in that case. Um, so I think we need to discuss that as a commission and decide what we think about it. But I also think we don't have a full group and we haven't had enough time to review the information because we didn't get it until really, really late. So I would prefer um, if we could have this discussion um, at our next meeting. And I wondered if the commission, what the commissioners thought about that. And I can see Holly wants to say something as well. Yes, with just with all due respect, I do want to just be on the record to say the HDC approved it. The HDC follows the Secretary of the Interior standards. Um, I think that needs to be understood. Also, I, I, I don't want to speak for Erin, but as a preservation planner herself, that's kind of part also with the whole work. She's not going to promote a, a job that is on a historic resource that's going to be in, in, against the Secretary of the Interior standards. So um, it's almost as if I'm hearing that this commission is trying to come up with its own set of standards, and I'm a little concerned on that. So that's just my thought right hey, now. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm really taken aback that you would say that. We are not trying to come up with our own standards. And the Secretary of Standards, the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation include a standard of reversibility, a, um, a standard of not, um, it, not restoring historical features unless you actually have documentation about them. Okay, so um, to, to suggest that we're not, you know, that we're trying to come up with our own standards of rehabilitation is, and yeah. So could, could I hear from some other commissioners as to whether or not we wanna make a determination on this if we feel like we've had enough time to review the material and that we actually want to support it? I'm happy to take a motion um, or we could have more time. I'll make a I'm motion that we, that we put it off until the next meeting. I think I would like to have more time and I think I'm hearing that from the others too, that we just aren't ready. I, I'd like to have more time. I think that in my mind, it, writing the letter of support for the tax credit is different in my mind than the HDC allowing the, the plans to go forward. I mean, they can say, yeah, the plans are okay with us, but they're not guaranteeing that it is, um, it is worthy of a tax credit. I think they're two different things. So I think it would be nice to have more time. Okay. All right, so Mickey's made a motion to defer this um, to the uh, March meeting and, yeah. Clement, and Tom has seconded it. Um, so let's take a, is there any more discussion on that from the commissioners? Okay, so um, Mickey? Aye. Clement? Aye. Uh, Tom? Aye. Barbara? Aye. And I'm also an aye. So I know this isn't what you wanted to hear, but I hope, um, it, you know, the documentation is complete. So we'll have time to review it. We'll have a more complete group in March. Um, and we can discuss it then. Mickey? I just have a question for, um, I don't know, Polly or Aaron. If, um, you know, is it still conceivable that, that they could be investigating lowering the building and still achieving their goals of creating a basement space? And, you know, that, that I think that would help us on, the, on our commission. It would help me tremendously. So I guess in the meantime, if, if that information so could be looked sure. into. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'll and, look into it. Thank you. Yeah. And I would just say, you know, um, a couple of things. I can appreciate that y'all didn't have uh, adequate time to review the additional materials. I apologize. I wasn't aware that you wanted to see those a week um, before. And uh, certainly I can give you, uh, appreciate you taking the time to more thoroughly um, look at the materials. I guess I'm just wondering, um, you know, is there anything additional you you need to see um, in order to make a decision? You know, this project um, will be reviewed by MHC and the Park Service for adherence to the Secretary's standards for rehabilitation. If they determine that the raising of the building does not meet the standards, then they will not be allowed to take the tax credit. 
Um, so at this point, we have HDC endorsement of the tax credit uh, of the raising of the building. They will not be able to take the tax credit if that is not determined to meet the standards. Um, what, what, you know, what additional considerations are you making? I mean, as far as meeting the standards, um, that will be evaluated. The front door, you know, restoration of missing features is acceptable under the standards if you have sufficient evidence, which we have presented in our tax credit applications and presented to you. Um, are there other aspects of the project that you need clarification so on? in order to make your determination. Erin, I think you bring up a really good point, which is this is going to be reviewed by the Park Service and ultimately the MHC will wanna know what the Park Service says. So I think if you get the response from the Park Service, you should um, provide that. Well, uh, MHC makes their own determination as well. They do not rely if, on the Park if Service. If you get the response from the Park Service, um, we'd like to see that. Okay, so yes, to answer your question, a response from the Park Service, would be something we'd want to see. If mm -hmm. that's something that you get and you can share. Um, mm -hmm. But I really, I, I, I do want to defend the ability of this historical commission to make a determination about a historic rehabilitation as regards a, a truly ancient structure that is um, in, you know, for such an old structure in quite good condition and increasingly rare in our historic district. So, you know, to have the view that, well, you can just, you know, push these things up and push them around and have them look quite different. They look, you know, consistent with Nantucket. It's an approvable project from an HDC perspective, but this is a different commission. And I don't, you know, I don't think that we should um, forget that we're preserving historic resources that have defining features, which include their position. Um, mm -hmm. So sure. thank you very just, much. Um, yeah, if, I just would like to note that MHC is not looking for you to assess whether the project meets the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. They're looking for your support for this project to move through the tax credit process in which they will be making that determination. I understand what the MHC is looking for and have talked to them at, at length. So thank you. Okay, um, can we move on to some of the other things on our agenda? Um, and we look forward to talking about this in March and getting the answer um, for you guys. All right, so thank to you. assist with this and try to have um, less confusion about timing um, and information. I did generate an application form and I sent it to Holly um, and I thought maybe we could look at it um, and that that would be something that would really help applicants um, and clarify matters. Now let me pull that up. I didn't have as much time as I wanted to. Unfortunately, I had HTC yesterday too. Yeah and I've been working over 40 hours. So um, not trying to make excuses, but. <laughs> no, it's okay. You know, it's something that we looked at but, before. Yes. And I think it's pretty straightforward and not controversial. Um, yep. So it's okay that you can have a chance to look at it. I can yep. look at it. But I, I'll bring that up. I, I do think it's a, um, we, again, I've been very clear about how I personally would like to be able to be more transparent with the, the public. You know, folks like Aaron um, at Epsilon and other uh, agencies out there that do historic tax credits, as well as the general public, so they understand um, what that all entails. So I, I agree 100% about getting a process. Sorry, I don't have it up available at the moment. Um, I have my other computer working. I can look for that. <laughs> so many emails. <clears throat> Think. Okay. 
I'm going to send it to you. Thank you. Sorry, I don't know where it is. Okay, for new applications. Yeah. So this is a form that we could post on the NHC site and Holly can have available to send to applicants. It is based um, almost exactly on the Preservation Massachusetts Inc. form. Um, so it makes it clear that um, in order to place your project on our agenda for discussion, we must receive the completed form at least one week before our scheduled meeting. After discussing your project, we require three business days to generate your support letter. Please plan accordingly to ensure the support letter for your application is ready before the deadline. And it also says we generally meet on the third Friday of every month. The meeting schedule is posted on the town of Nantucket website. Okay, and makes it clear that we might not, you know, if you don't get the information to us, in time, you might not be able to get your letter. Um, and then it asks for basic information. Um, this is all taken from the Preservation Massachusetts Inc. letter. Um, and just ask for the status of various stuff. And this will help us keep records, um, which I think is useful. Um, and help with consistency of information collected, which is something that will be helpful to applicants and something we want to achieve as well. One thing about the National Register aspect, I mean, the entire island is a National Register district, so. Right, but not every structure is contributing to the district, so. They have to but, fulfill the part one. Right. Okay. Just, I kind of think it, it, maybe it's a moot point, but maybe I'm just not understanding. Well, if it's a 1980s building, you know, and I'm just saying. Um, right, but who's going to be submitting an application if it's a 1980s building? That's what I'm saying. I think, I think it might be, this is obviously. Yeah, it might be an easy yes for them to check this off, but okay. they do have to do the part one. So are you saying maybe it would be more appropriate to say, um, to say contrib not yet determined to be contributing to the district, but like change the, the language. I don't even think it, it my, my opinion is there, somebody's not going to submit an application if it's non contrib if it's, if it's, it doesn't meet, I don't know. I, I just, they've already done the research at this point if they're submitting a new application for this commission's support. So, um, you, you know, again, this would be helpful for another location that's not an entire in, a, in, in our um, district. I just think it's a, it's a moot point for Nantucket. It just, I think the whole thing is that section just needs to go away, but maybe that's just me. Well, but I think Holly, the reason why we need, it doesn't necessarily have to be this, but something has to stay in because if the project is not determined by the part one application to be eligible for tax credits, then it can't proceed. And we have had projects come to us um, where there was a question as to whether or not, and we were asked to weigh in to determine that it was eligible. So, understanding where they are, you know, they, ha they have to go through that process. So this right. is just asking us to, asking them to tell us if they've done it. Got it. You know what I mean? But I agree that, you know, we might be able to change the language to be more clear because in every other location, you actually have to be listed or determined eligible. And here you're not gonna actually be listed. So maybe we clean that up a little bit. Is that what you're saying, Holly? Um, is the project using, okay. And then, so if it's using the federal tax credit, then check a box about where they are in that process. 
um, the intended use. Um, this is again, uh, pretty much taken from the PMI form, which had the question about intended use. They had total number of housing units and I've added in year round rental housing um, because I think that's the issue on our island. Um, but these, again, these questions were on their form. Um, so obviously they're gonna be attaching additional um, pages, but this is all from the PMI form that we looked at before and in fact had commentary from an applicant on as well. And that's that's pretty much it. Is there any more, Holly? Yeah, community benefit. And that's your phone number, Holly. Okay. Um, I know it, probably everybody wants to think about this, but any reactions or comments? No? Okay. So maybe, um, you know, we can get, um, if you wanna take time and give Holly comments and Holly and I can continue to work on this and it might be something we could um, approve at our next meeting to post. Okay, um, there's also a follow-up one, but just in the interest of time, maybe I'll just work on that with Holly, if that's okay. Okay, um, great. So the next topic is our advised surveys of historic resources. Um, so we got our grant in for 2022-2023. Um, we uh, submitted a plan that included continuing with our surveying the fish lots and starting with the surveys of Brant Point um, and Cliffside area. Um, and the grant application is with the MHC. It all got in on time. And I'd love to um, hear a motion to accept the grant just so it can all be official. I see you saying so moved, uh, Tom. So moved. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Clement. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, Mickey. Hi. Um, Clement. Hi. Tom. Hi. Barbara. Hi. And I am also an I. Terrific. Thank you, Holly, for getting this in on time. Um, Betsy Tyler also really helped. Okay, um, the next uh, topic is the update on our um, survey. So I'm gonna turn it over to Holly. Yes, so first off, I wanted to, and I apologize I wasn't able to get this to you sooner, Hillary, but, but the revised schedule, uh, which is different than um, what was in the, your packet, um, since, as you all know, it, it, we kind of got a hard start getting up and running um, from procurement issues and all that kind of stuff. So, but at the end of the day, these are their deadlines, if you will, for the project. Um, while they were here back in December, PAL um, really tried to um, maximize their time on Nantucket for three days. So they actually did a lot of their recognizant surveys for both the uh, survey plan and the um, the pilot for the, for the fish lots. Um, they were here December 14th, 15th, and 16th, as I think few of you are aware. Um, and they uh, have just basically, they've completed, they kind of put a couple of phases together. So phase one and phase two of the plan um, have a deadline of April 25th, um, as you see on here. And then um, the field uh, work, um, from is uh, February, March um, that they're working on. So 
I wanted to provide that to you all. But then the email that I forwarded to you, and again, kind of just like with the Beaver Street, um, I that was sent to me after the fact. So I don't expect you guys to provide information right now, but you all have a copy of it. You know that through our RFP with um, the project, we have asked for, um, well, basically part of the pro overall project, we get um, example surveys. And through our survey group that we had, we um, decided on a couple of, of sites within um, the fish lots that are right now currently threatened. Sorry, they're in Word, so I was going to open them up for you all, um, which is 26, 27, and 29 Fair Street. Here, I'll bring up 26. And these are really what we're going to see um, for our surveys. And so this is what we're, is going to supplement is our Form Bs. This is what's going to supplement any of the old 1989, 88, 87, around that time frame of the surveys that are um, the HTC did in, in, in the fish lots, which um, are not that detailed. However, I will say that there was a, uh, quite a few of the lots within the, the fish lots that have been surveyed for either a, a marker um, or just a little history book from NPT. So Betsy Tyler did a lot of those, um, those histories and uh, they provided those to us. So we were able to provide them to PAL. But here's your example of what surveys should be like. Um, Form Bs, anybody who has a uh, preservation restriction on their property will actually have a Form B obviously associated with it, just like any of the historic tax credits um, that people get. So this is an example, um, very thorough depth, um, so much better than um, our, our old HDC surveys. This is just what um, we need to see, um, which is Charles H. Robinson. So very detailed. You have your bibliography obviously associated with it. Um, any photographs? And this is exactly the format that it, it should be in. So we've got no issues with with that. Um, do you see this next one? I don't know if it came through or not. Right now we're still seeing okay. um, the Italianate Victorian. All right, so let me stop real quick. Cancel. I just want to say we were pulling that up. It is just fantastic to see this product. I mean, this is like a world of difference <laughs> of information. It is, it's fantastic. Um, and I, I, I think that they're going to do a hundred of these. Yep. Tom, go ahead. I, I wanted to say, I mean, uh, the, the best product that this commission, I think, has done so far was the uh, thing we, we did on the uh, cobblestones and the sidewalks and all that. But this is going to be, I think, our finest hour when we, uh, when we finally get this all done. This is really going to put this commission on the map. Well, both commissions. I mean, obviously, yeah. through the through the process, the historical commission is the one that's that that handles the planning aspect of it. But we wouldn't have done it without being a CLG, which requires both commissions right. together. Exactly. But that we, um, we've been the ones that did that too. Yeah. <laughs> well. Yeah. Um, you know, being being a certified local government has allowed us to be able to, to get into that funding source from from the federal government, which is fantastic. And as as Hillary mentioned, and as I, I brought up, being able to continue that, um, and hopefully we hear something soon. I think last year we heard in in March, um, so that should be coming up within About a couple of weeks that we forward. hear. Yeah, which would you know, I'm I'm very optimistic, um, but at the end of the day, I don't want to sing until <laughs> we we hear. But yes, this work that that Powell's working on for us here is the wood box, and we all know, um, as of right now, um, their applications before both the planning board and the uh, HDC have been stagnant. Um, they're just sitting there. I don't know, haven't heard anything um, what they're doing at all. So they're just sitting they're there negotiating um, with the neighbors, Holly. Okay, which is well, what everybody yeah. wanted them to do, which exactly. is good. communication. Yeah. But this. For instance, this structure was surveyed um, intently, just had a large file from the uh, PIN students uh, from, oh, I don't even know how many, how many years ago, but then it was also documented with HABs. Um, so 
quite extensive history, as we all know. Um, great bibliography, showing the structures. I would hope to see more photographs. I would hope to see more um, historic documentation with the Bunker family um, in here. Let's get, get that listed here. But there was also a lot of information that was provided to them. So anyway, very, very excited to see that. Um, again, you received that this morning. So take a look at it. Really take your time um, in, in looking at the, at the information as well as the report and the specifically the list of structures that they've provided. Obviously, that was something that through our little work group um, emphasized how we wanted them to just go geographically up Fair Street and over and get that um, 100 properties out of the 100 and something that we provided in our queue. So, so um, yep. Well, Holly, thank you. In terms of next steps, um, I'm very interested to know, and I'm sure we all are, about the HDC, if the HDC feels that these forms are going to be helpful to them, because that's the whole point of this, is to be able for the HDC to have these forms when they review these buildings. Yep. Um, so if there's anything that they feel is missing, I mean, I think right now we're in the period where the consultant is looking for feedback from us because these are sample forms that will yep. set the standard for what they're going to be generating for all of the other forms um, in the future. Yes, Tom. Um, I agree with you that, you know, there's obviously, you know, benefits and, and specifically for the HDC, but I, you know, just because we are the ones that are doing this in terms of my last comment, then it's gonna be great. I think that, you know, in 50 years, who knows? I mean, this place is changing so fast. What, what will happen with the HDC? I think this is just really good information to have in the file in town. Mm -hmm. We're all gone, and uh, mm -hmm. the next guys, you know, going to have to go somewhere for some information, and we're going to have provided it. Uh, it's yeah. absolutely vital. So, can everybody take some time to go through this and just mark it up be, and look at it, not just for the information, but you know what's missing. The um, the format is set. I mean, we have to follow the form B, but um, if you want to see any, see them have any other different approach to keep in mind because they're gonna be rolling this out. Um, and Holly will get that same feedback from the HDC. Um, yes. Holly, could you pull up the timeline again? Because one of the thing, I'm sorry, I just, you know, <laughs> I'm seeing it for the first time. I just need to look at it a little bit longer about where we are so we can know um, where, because we have to manage this project and we wanna make sure that we're paying attention to the deadlines and the deliverables. Uh, so that it really gets done and gets done right. Okay. I got so many screens open. Sorry, guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, while you find that, I want to make one other announcement to everybody, which is that you know we have this group of people that are the um, on the uh, point with Pal with any questions about the 2021-2022 survey, and that group is Tom, Barbara. Um, Betsy Tyler, and it has been me. And I've actually asked Angus to take my place on that um, because uh, I think he has a lot of important skills um, to bring to that. And, I, and I'm and i now working on the 2021-2022 survey. So I, anyway, Angus agreed. So I'm just announcing that there's been a shift there and I won't be participating in those small groups. Yes, Tom? I'm just curious um, on those form Bs, I don't know if this is uh, just adding more uh, stuff to it or not, you know, time and effort and money, but I'm just curious as to, is it possible to, to get a photograph if they're doing it now on, of all four sides of the house rather than just the front of the house, or doesn't that matter? I, I think that's the sort of thing to put on the form when you give the feedback to Holly. Yes, please do. Yeah. Because that that is a, a legitimate, um, comment. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, I'm just bringing that up because of what we've just spent an hour and 15 minutes discussing at Beaver Street. I mean, if we had going forward four, four sides of that house um, direct on, there would be a, a lot less uh, controversy. Yeah. On, uh -huh. on. yeah, so we could certainly say to the consultant, we want, you know, elevations of every face as standard. Um, now they won't be able to get that because they can't go on private property. That's right. a consideration. 
but to the extent that they can. Um, okay, so here's where we are in terms of the status. The, the, we have a survey plan, um, and then we have the, uh, the pilot Form B production, which is called the Historic Properties Survey. The survey plan, they can so they completed phase one by December 20th. Did they can that's done is phase one complete, right? Holly? Yep. And yep. but we've asked for an are we on to phase two for the survey plan or have we asked for a meeting? We still have to wait for a meeting. We're still, yes. So so for the overall survey plan, this is where I've been trying to get a meeting scheduled with MHC and I haven't heard anything. Yeah. Okay, but they're continuing. Or have they moved on to phase two? They're in. They're in phase two. Yes. They're working. Okay, so it's not yes. like they stopped the work and are waiting for the meeting. Okay, correct. So they're correct. working on phase two, and as far as we know, we're on track with April twenty fifth. And we've had a map update, which Holly is going to show to us. Yes. Um, and we expect this to be completed in July. Yep. Um, and then for the property survey. Um, Phase, the pilot survey forms is actually part of phase two there. I guess they're running behind um, because they're just getting these to us now. Well, um, the, is that the, right, Holly? No, these were actually sooner rather than later per uh, Ginny's email. That the, the, the foreign bees that they just sent us were actually ahead of time. That's what I understood from her email. Um, Cause the, yeah. well, these are, this is the pilot survey phase two product. So I think we've had to move the phase two. She, her email says, attached for NHC and MHC review are the Nantucket pilot survey phase two products. The list of properties we surveyed, the phase two Hello. memorandum and the sample inventory. And that was due January 24th, and we've gotten it now. So, I'd just like to make a comment about what we were just talking about, what uh, Holly just mentioned, or, and you mentioned. We have a map, and uh, the group that you mentioned, you, me, uh, Betsy, Barbara, that we were, we were going over that map, and we, we had a second meeting about it, but we never did finish it. We have yet to have yet a third meeting to finish, um, I think, Cliff Road and, and some other interior areas on, on both sides of that. So, so this is the map, Tom, um, which I believe I emailed to, to you when uh, everybody that's in the, that group, um, when, when Angus asked about it, I, I, think, I, I think at the end of the day, um, I don't think, Ginny was expecting us to retrieve it back from a, a previous email. So I actually did send the link after they told us that Melissa had updated it. So this is it. And then what Ginny had asked us to do internally is to really dive into the town area. So everything that you see on this working map um, that has the, the black and yellow lines are the boundaries that we, through our internal discussions with PAL, have established for these areas. So now we have to really dive what into this. I'm, what I'm saying is, I think when when we finished the last meeting, we just ran out of time. We took almost two hours, and uh, I, I think that there was there was still some, I don't know, it was Crooked Lane, uh, Cliff Road, uh, you know, the uh, the Rocky Road to Dublin down there, and and uh, North Beach Street and all of that. I don't think we we ever did complete. Some of Correct. The, the, she has, she, they have asked us to in, internally do that. Um, and we had said, we had asked when exactly. Um, and she said, as long as it was done before their April 25th deadline. So um, yes, that's something that I was going to reach out to the, the little subcommittee group and see when, what would work for everybody to, to yeah. get together to flush this part out. Yeah, yep. That's the reason I bring it up. Yep. It. Oh no, not a problem. But I already had this ready to available because um, Hillary asked me to, to have it so we could all take a look at it. But it's pretty cool. So the significance of the map, if I'm correct, Holly, is that this shows the neighborhoods that will be called out in the survey plan. Correct. So when they deliver the survey plan, it's going to identify neighborhoods, identify uh, a preliminary list of resources in the neighborhoods. 
um, and then prioritize the neighborhoods and estimate the cost for surveying the neighborhoods. Um, and these are the neighborhoods that they're identifying. Now there's some pinpoints like Upper Vestal Dukes Road. Does that mean there's going to be a special focus on that or is that? These, interpret this these little, yes. Yeah, so these little areas. So um, after the group, the internal group met, when you all met separately and I, I wasn't able to meet with you, came up with the actual list of areas. Um, I tried to interpret that as best as I possibly could, could and provide that to PAL. So that's what these little marks are, but this is where we need to refine a little bit better. So I think like, for instance, when, when the group of us were get, got together with um, Jenny and, and Melissa, um, you know, there's a discussion, well, where exactly do we want to have, you know, the, the mid-island area, which, wow, there's a lot of detail here, layers. Um, we really need to, 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 to define, you know, and again, we were trying to not go in a tangent. There was a couple of times where I think Barbara, myself, and, and Tom, we'd say something, but it's like, oh, wait a minute, are we getting too much in the weeds here? Um, so there was, trying. It was, it was, it's a little difficult. So I think that was another reason why uh, Ginny's expecting us to internally really, really go into the town center of Nantucket and, and define that a little bit better, where it was easier to do it on the outskirts of all those areas. Um, and and just for, for everybody on um, commission's sake, the main boundaries were defined by um, A, other areas that were done previously with the overall sur the recognizant surveys that were done in 89, B, um, areas that had to be defined um, that weren't already defined through our um, internal town um, permitting software program, which is called Intergov. And we, we, some of these were a little bit arbitrary, but we had to define areas because it's all GIS based, but we were able, we have flexibility to change that for this obviously program. We want to make sure it's accurate. One thing that Barbara did bring up was um, the cemeteries that the town owns need to be also included. Those are, those are form, those are areas um, that are obviously historic. Um, I have just, Barbara, I was able to um, get a, a copy of that information. So I'm going to be able to forward that on to PAL so they can pinpoint those areas on here. Um, so yeah, this is, this is a, a, a work in progress, but just want to give everybody a little sense of, of how these areas came, came to be. And I, I, think, I think we really did a good job. That's going to be completed before April 25th, Polly, is that right? Correct. Yes. Yes, yes. So can I suggest then, Holly, that um, I've just written down that it's due, I wrote down April 24th, um, but whatever. Um, can we have then, is it reasonable to say in March, we'll get the final map for approval at this commission? Yep. I, I think that's the latest. As, as far, I'm, and I'm trying to figure out what do you, what do you, we well, as we, the, we as an internal group need to flesh out the rest of it of yes. the center of town and give that information to PAL before their April twenty fifth deadline right. of this section. So obviously, yes, we want to we want to have that done sooner rather than later. Yeah. Right. So my question was, could this come back in a mostly finished form for the third week of March and get the commission to sign off on it? Is that enough time for Holly and everybody else to, you know, get it together? That's the well. I, I'm leaving the island on March 25th, so I'm hoping for two weeks. I'm hoping that we will. I don't know who's in charge of scheduling it, but um, that would be us internally. Sooner. So, yep. Sooner rather than later. Got it. Yeah. I'm in favor. Of the sooner the better. Get it. Yeah. Okay. We can do that. Yeah, and since they want it in April, we really have to approve it in March unless we want to have a special meeting. So um, so we'll look for that in March. And thank you all um, for continuing to refine this map. It's I know it's time consuming, but it's so complicated and it's really the framework for the whole survey going forward. So it's critical to get it right. And we also have to defend it to people. You know, <laughs> we have to explain that we have to be really confident that it is the right neighborhood um, delineation. And then I think we should ask, um, given that we've confirmed that the pilot survey phase two products 
the, the form Bs and the other information that Holly circulated this morning is part of phase two, which had a January deadline, just find out if they want to revise the um, survey plan, the pilot survey plan, you know, these dates, they move, they can move. So I just think we want to know from them if they still believe that they're going to be able to deliver the other phases in the current schedule or if they want to revise the schedule. Is that, does that make sense, Holly? Oh, we can't hear you. <laughs> we also couldn't see that you were talking, so. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yes, I'll touch base with Jenny and ask her if that's something that she wants to, to refine that even more. Um, this, those dates that I gave you are based on what they gave me when we were finalizing our contract with them um, versus the RFP. Um, because of the time frame, so yeah, I don't. Yeah, I'll touch base with her and ask if that's something that's going to be fixed. Or, okay. Yeah. All right. So I think we've moved through that part of the agenda: the scheduling phase one review, the which we're waiting for from the map update, the schedule update. Um, we have other items on our agenda for the day, um, but we don't have time to do them justice. So. I'm going to ask something that I haven't asked in a while. Would you all be willing to schedule an extra meeting to take care of these final two bullet point agendas? Because we really, um, I think, need to talk about them. And I don't want to push it off till March because we'll probably have to have some something else will come up that will squeeze the agenda. What are, what are the other um, topics? So we had an agenda item for uh, the annual town meeting talking about any warrant articles that are of interest to the historical commission, which is probably a fairly involved discussion. Um, and including what, if anything, we want to say and how we would want to say it. Um, and then we have um, priority work uh, for the year, um, which none of which has been really organized and we want to have a plan for how if we still want to prioritize these things how we're going to work on them you know if anybody has capacity and i'd like to have more of a full commission when we talk about those things um i think uh, what mickey wanted to know is a solar solar panel uh you know a citizen's warrant and hot tubs and spas and uh, and just a, a cultural resources there's about uh four or five uh, articles just on that. And that, that's kind of what we need to do. Yeah, we should go through the warrant and see if you know we feel we can advise the voters on anything relevant to cultural resources. Um, so can we schedule an interim meeting? We, well, when is our next meeting? You were mentioning April. I, I, I mean, we're not scheduled March, for March, March, March 18th. March. March 18th, yeah, I thought it was every month. If, if yes, it was, it's the third, it so Friday, March. It would be the 25th of March, the first, uh, 25th of February, the 4th of March, the 11th of March, before the 18th of March. Thank you, Tom. Um, in terms I, of, yeah, next I, week is bad. Yes, Barbara. I was just gonna say, I, I have a commitment on March 4th. Well, we don't have to meet on a Friday. It's not a regular meeting. Friday, so. I'm just giving it, since we meet on Friday, yeah. I just said the Fridays. Um, I Next week is bad, I can't meet next. I mean, I guess I could meet the morning of the 23rd if we wanted to go through these things. I cannot. Okay. Um, what about the week of February 28th? Are there any days when we could meet not on a Friday? School vacation week, um, but I, I can uh, squeeze at any a meeting in if it's needed. Um, well, that week, I mean, I'm generally available to meet between nine and two. Um, is there any day that's particularly good or bad for anybody? What week are we talking about here? The week of February 28th. The week of 20, February 28th is Monday. 
and then the 27th. Well, that whole week, yeah, the 28th, March 1st, 2nd or 3rd. Are there any days that are stand out as being? Well, no, I, I think I can do any of them. Holly, do you have a preferred day that week? Barbara's not available on Friday. Nope. No. Okay, they're all equally bad days to me. <laughs> Fine, I'm just juggling vacation with my husband. So. Oh, right, okay. Um, well, what about meeting on Tuesday, March 1st? Okay. Do you want to stick with the 10 a.m. time? That's fine. Okay. That's also the first day of Women's History Month. I, unfortunately, I can't do that, do that at all that day. I'm, I'm in Boston that entire day. Do you want to suggest a day, Ken? Because we'd love to have you with us. Well, the, the, the Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday that week are okay for me right now. Okay. Wednesday the 2nd at 10? That works for me. That's yeah. Good for everybody. Yeah. Okay. Yes, good for me. All right. Thank you for agreeing to this special meeting. Hopefully, it works for our members who aren't here. And I, I will, will touch base with town admin on uh, our Zoom. It shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. Great. Um, I guess probably there's going to be some guidance about a return to in-person meetings soon. Yeah, I haven't heard anything yet. Everyone's kind of decided they like Zoom, I think. <laughs> uh, it, it, yeah. it's, a re it's a real problem with respect to physical space is the issue. Because <laughs> uh, uh, there is a very limited amount of physical space available for in-person meetings. And so Select Board is in fact looking at hybrid meetings uh, and but and they and Erica are working through this to figure out what is in fact potentially possible. So it's a while before we have an answer. That's a good point. Or that's good information. Thank you. Um, there's one other thing that I wanted to bring up under um, other business, which is that we seem to have lost participation from our select board liaison. Um, you know, I have invited Dawn to meetings, obviously our meetings are regular and I don't know what's going on. I mean, I haven't actually asked her. I try, I reached out for conversations and I couldn't schedule anything, but you know, the onus is on me, I guess, to follow up and make it happen. And I'm sure she'll be available to talk if I keep um, bugging her about it. But um, I do think it's important to have a liaison with the select board because stuff comes up and it's just important to have that dialogue. Um, anyway, I just wanted to flag that I was aware of this issue. I do think it's an issue and invite any discussion or comment or observations about that. Who's, who is it that selects their rep representatives? Do they choose or do, do we they invite choose. Like, including saying that they don't want to have a representative. I mean, that's also a choice. And, you know, we for, what, were, yeah. for, for, what, it's, for what it's worth, I, I do see a benefit of having a select board liaison. So I would like to see it continue. I certainly agree with that. Um, well, maybe we should find out why Dawn isn't coming to our meetings. And if she wants to continue to be our representative, um, Ken, do you have any advice about this? Well, I just just talked to Dawn and ask her. I yeah. mean, I, I know the select board, in fact, makes a determination with respect to amongst their members who uh, sits on the various committees, uh, and then it's, and be, as you know from the agendas, uh, they ask for reports uh, of the select board members as to the committee meetings that they've attended. So it's an important function for them because it's a way for them to to stay involved. Uh, but uh, I have no idea at all with respect to why Dawn's had unfortunately missed a couple of meetings. So. Yeah, I mean, at this point, it's, I think it's been five or even six, I don't know, don't, don't hold me to that, but it's consistent enough. And I also don't really hear from her. So, so I'll ask her and just express also that it's that we all want to have a select board um, liaison. And the other reason why I think it's really important is that 
it's not like the HTC has a select board liaison. So, you know, as far as liaising with and keeping in touch with cultural resources, which are so important to the island, this is really the best way to do that. Yes. HD is a different type of, of, of committee. It's a regulatory committee. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so it, it has specific things with respect to the legislation as to its membership, which is different from a lot of the other town committees, which are set up by the town. So um, th there's a difference in terms of the regulatory committees. And I'm not, I'm sorry, I didn't, I hope you didn't think I was suggesting that they should or that that was some sort of oversight. I'm just saying that if we don't have a select board liaison, there is no liaison with the select board and cultural resources, except perhaps through the CPC, which isn't really, you know, that has a different mission. So, unless to I'm that, missing. I just wanted to mention, I, I, I to that point, I, I, I think I understood you, Hillary, um, because when it comes to the CLG, for instance, I include her with that so she can be aware and kind of inform the, you know, as needed, uh, the select board from a CLG perspective. So yeah, yeah I, I do see the overall benefit of having somebody. Yeah. Okay, Tom had a hand up. Well, yeah, I, I just, you know, as far as this conversation is concerned, the HDC isn't appointed by the, by the uh, they're elected. We're appointed by the select board, which is why I think it's important for us to have a liaison. Another good point. Okay. All right. I, you know what? I'm going to call Dawn when we get off the meeting and let her know about our special meeting and ask her if she's what's going on. So, um, and I'll report back. Um, okay. Anything else? Any, anybody have any other business? I move we adjourn. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Okay. We're right on time. Of course, we didn't get to a quarter of our agenda, but that's okay. <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you so much. Have a great um, President's Day holiday. Thank you, too. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Very productive. Bye.